Hare Krishna Gopal Hari Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Hare Krishna Prabhu. My obeisance is all glory to Shri Prabhupada. Yeah. You know, our last podcast on the problem of evil, this, uh, actually that was probably one of the most, you could say, intellectually stimulating podcasts we have ever had. And several devotees told me that they liked it, but they had to hear it two, three times to understand it. We did go into a little bit uh, intricacies of various arguments used by different traditions and what our tradition has to say. So yeah. I thought we could discuss on, uh, on the recent book that you have published, uh, Kan Maya in the Bhagavad Puran. You have a copy of that book? You can show it also. We'll give a link afterwards. Before we yes, right okay. here. This is the uh, Indian edition, the paperback edition that's been printed. Okay. And then I also have the, um, the hardbound edition. Oh, okay. So that's wonderful. Uh, so congratulations. It's quite a directly, what do you say? <clears throat> a directly, you could say, scriptural topic, which, which mm-hmm. you have presented. And I read the book recently. I felt that just, there is a, there is a, you have been able to present the Gaudiya tradition's uh, understanding without having to do in a, in a very contemporarily appealing way in that. Mm-hmm. So maybe we could start with how did you, was this your PhD thesis topic or how did you choose this particular topic to uh, write a book about? Yes. So um, initially, when I began my studies at Oxford University, um, I wanted to do something uh, related with science. You know, it was something that, you know, um, I was interested in uh, relating, you know, Vaishnav theology with science, relating uh, science and and religion. And uh, I started to read about books on science and religion. And there's a few, you know, very famous authors in this field. Uh, one of them is John Pockinghorn. Uh, okay. you know, there's John Hedley Brooke, John Pockinghorn, Arthur Peacock, uh, the, uh, Ian Barber. These were the big names at that time. But the founder of this field of science and religion in uh, Cambridge and Oxford was John Pockinghorn. And um, he has this book, Science and Equinimical Discourse, something like this. I, I'm forgetting the, ex- the exact name of the book. And in that, it's one of his few books where he talks about science and other world religions other than Christianity. So most of these scholars that are very famous, they do science and Christianity, and they generally come from a Christian background, are most likely practicing Christians. Um, And so uh, they were just starting to explore, well, what what would it look like if we did science and other world religions? And so he has a chapter on Buddhism. He has a chapter on Judaism, not really even chapters, just a few pages. And his section on science and Hinduism was also there. And I read that section. And in that, he wrote that I think that um, any uh, discourse between science and religion, uh, between science and Hinduism, must begin with the conception of Maya. Because uh, from my, you know, just brief studies of Hinduism, he said, it appears to me that Maya in Hinduism is the world. And, you know, Maya is is how they describe the world, identify the world. And science is a field of study that's interested in examining the world. So it studies the world. So if we're going to do a discussion or relationship between science and Hinduism, we first of all need to know what do Hindus conceive of in terms of their world. What, what is the world for them? Uh, if you're going to you know, relate two things, you need to first identify what those two things are. And so science and Maya need to be studied. So I became a little enthusiastic by this. I said, okay, the, the expert in the field is saying this is what the need is. This is, as we say, the lacuna in scholarship, the gap in scholarship. So let me work on that. So then I started you know, working on science and Maya but then I myself, I, I, I start to realize that I don't have a clear understanding of my, well, what Maya is, nor is the understanding of Maya presented in our tradition clearly uh, in contemporary times. So then rather than doing the whole thing, I said, before we do that, I just have to focus on Maya. What is Maya? And so therefore my book, this is how it came about. My book is on Maya in the Bhagavad Purana. 
Oh, okay. So that's why, I, I, from what I had interacted with you or I heard about you, you were originally planning to do a your thesis in science and religion, and then you shifted to a more, what I thought was a more theological topic. So it was not actually a shift. It was, it was you could say a more strategic repositioning so that you could actually serve a need in that that, that area itself. Yes, and, and also in the in the course of it, my interest in in religion and theology increased. Uh, so, so now I am doing, you know, just uh, religious studies also and ethics and, you know, in, in addition to science and religion. Uh, initially, I did my master's in science and religion. So I did do a, a, a MST in science and religion. But then when I came to write my PhD, I realized that in terms of uh, scholarship, contemporary scholarship, we are sort of in, in, in the realm of, not we exactly, but Hinduism is so far behind that even before we do science and religion, we first need to academically present what the religion is. And it was that recognition or realization that led me to, okay, first I need to write a book on Maya. People are misunderstanding what Maya is. Every, the whole world thinks, you know, Maya is something else when in fact, this is not what Maya is. So first of all, I need to present what Maya is, uh, try to dispel the misconceptions. And then once people have a clear understanding of what Maya is, we can look And other scholars, uh, they can work on you know, science and Maya. That's true. Yeah. You know, recently I is to develop this topic of Maya. Recently I was reading a book on say history of Indian philosophy. So it came, I read a very striking point that there are two kinds of philosophers. This is one is, and they accept the everyday reality that we experience, our, our everyday experience as real, mm -hmm. and then they try to get a deeper experience, deeper understanding of our everyday experience. That is one approach to philosophy. And that is more or less in the Western tradition embodied by Aristotle. And whereas another approach is that they overturn everyday experience and they say actually over everyday experience is a deception. And Actually, there is a deeper reality, which is obscure. There is an actual reality, which is quite different, radically different from everyday experience. And it is that. So in one sense, everyday experience is rejected in the pursuit of what is considered reality. And that approach was more of Plato and Socrates, who were looking for the essences of things. I think Aristotle pioneered more of the empirical method, which laid the foundation for modern science. So... The, uh, uh, I mean, I would like to comment on this, this, these two approaches, but in general, it does seem that even in no, traditions that may not be immediately not theistic, even mm -hmm. there, the understanding that there is some kind of dif distance and difference between reality and our day, everyday experience, that seems to be a, almost like a universal idea across uh, history and geography. Yes, I, I fully agree. And, uh, and uh, you know, another example in Western philosophy is Immanuel Kant, where Immanuel Kant believed that the world that we see is the world of phenomena, but actual reality is the noumena. Now, because he was a philosopher and not a theologian, he believed we could not know the noumena. The noumena is out of reach. We cannot know what the reality is behind the phenomena. But we, we in theology, we are determined to know that noumena. We are determined to know uh, what the essence or the reality is behind the phenomena, and very much also like you have mentioned, Plato and you know and the cave, Plato and the, and the shadow world, uh, his idea of, of reality in the shadow world, uh, perfect beauty and its reflection, and these are some of the things actually I talk about in my book that this is this whole discussion is the discussion of Maya, that Maya itself is not just illusion. The world is not illusion for the, uh, you know, the Indian sages. But in fact, the world is a reflection. The world is a, you know, a shadow world uh, in relation to reality. It's a reflection of the real, real world. And in fact, and this is something I don't mention in my book, um, there is you know, ample evidence that the reason why Plato and Socrates were saying what they're saying, and like you're saying, they, they were not accepting the empirical method is because they were in touch or in communication with Indian sages. And there's actually archeological historical evidence for this. 
uh, Edwin Bryant uh, in his book, um, uh, you know, in his introduction to his 10th book, uh, translation of the Bible, yeah. talks about this, that how there are columns in Greece where there are inscriptions of Hindu gods, uh, you know, inscription of the word Krishna, actually. And in India, you have, you know, columns and, and you know, temples where there's inscriptions of Greek gods. So there was communication between them. And Plato was getting many of these ideas of, of the reflection, you know, the, the world as a reflection, the same metaphor that's used in the Vedas. He was getting these ideas from Vedic scriptures. Another evidence for this is also linguistic. Uh, in his book, um, uh, uh, The Republic, he talks about how the soul, the soul is, is a swan. He describes the oh. soul as a swan, yes. Okay. And, you know, um, uh, linguists, they say that there's just no way that there's a, just such a happy coincidence that he's talking about the soul as a swan. And in Sanskrit texts, they talk about the soul as a hansa and a great soul as a paramahansa. And so there has to be some communication between these two cultures. And therefore, these cultures were talking amongst themselves. And uh, these very esoteric ideas of the world as reflection and how this world is phenomena, but behind it, there's a real world, a noumena. There's... Um, uh, we, we should not um, take our perception, our empirical uh, knowledge through our um, observation so seriously. This, these, these ideas, they are coming from uh, Eastern origins. And, and, or, or the main point is not who was first. The main point is that this is the same discussion that's being discussed in different parts of the world in approximately the same time period. Yeah, it's true. And you, to some extent... Even within science, now as science has advanced, actually even science is saying that the world of sensory experience is not the actual world to some extent because quantum physics and relativity, especially quantum physics, the postulates of the quantum physics, uh, they make no sense in terms of our sensory experience. So it seems that in whichever field of knowledge we go deeper, this distance between our everyday experience and any, you could say, model or conception of reality at a deeper level, that difference we seem to, humanity seems to crop up, uh, it seems to pop up everywhere. I fully agree. And, you know, most of the time people point to quantum physics and sort of, the, you know, these things. But, I mean, even more basic than that, most scientists today accept the fact, they, they recognize the fact that science is pointing to a reality or to some reality that is beyond space and time. Because uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, which has been proved over and over again, I mean, that's sort of just common accepted science that space and time are relative. One of the things that it showed is that space and time are elements in this universe. The universe does not exist in space and time, but rather space and time are elements in the universe. Now, if space and time are elements in the universe, then what is the universe? What is the universe itself? It must be something that's beyond space and time. Uh, and so, so um, you know, and also there's antimatter, dark matter. So in so much phenomena, it's not just quantum physics. Quantum physics is one powerful example of it, like you've mentioned. But so much phenomena is showing that there is something beyond space and time. Now, all the tools of science are there to study space and time. The only tools and methods that they have is to study the world of space and time. Now they want to study something beyond space and time. So how do they do that? It's very frustrating, you know, how, how do you do that? Well, this is a question that science is asking now, but religion and philosophy have been asking this question since a thousand years, what's beyond space and time? So if someone has been asking a question for over a thousand years and someone is just starting to ask a question, then who, who is more likely to know the answer who, or who's, who's more likely to have more insight into it? So, I mean, this is at least, it's, it's now obvious that science and religion are both asking the same question. The answers might be different, but they're asking the same question and they're asking a question that religion has been asking since thousands of years. And, and so there's no choice but to turn towards spirituality or religion to try to find answers to this. That's beautiful. 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, there are many scientists who are also trying to write books which address philosophical questions. Now, how well they do that because of the prestige that they have in science, sometimes their books might get more uh, mileage and credibility than what actually uh, they would get if they were subjected to serious philosophical or logical scrutiny. But it does seem, I like this point, that both of them are moving toward the same questions. So it seems that, is to elaborate this point, see, within science, there is one approach which is more technology-centered. How can we do things faster, better, easier? But there is also a trend which is looking for a deeper understanding of reality. And it seems that, uh, to some extent, those efforts are not being very successful. That's why there are books like The End of Physics, From Certainty to Uncertainty. And uh, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of, you could say, epistemological, epistemological challenges that science is coming up when it starts addressing fundamental questions about the nature of reality itself. Yes, and there is an argument to be made that science has advanced so much that it has actually found its own limits. And like you're pointing out, technologically speaking, okay, you can keep making bigger and bigger machines or faster machines. But in terms of the true science, like physics, chemistry, the pure sciences, um, science has advanced enough that it's found its own limits. It's like now the boundary is space and time. So if you want to move anything beyond it, you have to move beyond space and time. And somewhere I read, I, I don't know where, you know, you read so many things and you forget where it is that somewhere I read that some very cutting edge new scientists, they are looking into yoga and meditation as kind of technologies or ways to bend, you know, the space time uh, limit and move beyond space and time. Yeah. Oh. So, so I mean, science has found its own limit. It's, it's given up. It's like, okay, this is, this is it. Now, now, of course you, we can, travel farther in space, but science knows that there's a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars. And the universe is almost unlimited, if not unlimited. And this is just an approximation. As far as they know, there could be 101 billion stars, each containing 102 billion galaxies. So they put out a number there, but they know that, okay, we can travel farther, but I mean, there's no end to the universe. We can, we can keep traveling farther. So, so it, conceptually speaking, they seem to have found their limits. That's so true. So is there, I, I took quantum physics as a specific example because the challenges there are very widely known and acknowledged. Although of course, they are sometimes used to justify any kind of new age beliefs. The uncertainty of the quantum physics sometimes is used as a license, but in general, has science come up with anything like Maya that there is some epistemological barrier that may prevent us from knowing the nature of reality? I know there's uh, the evolution that Newton's time, the idea was of a clockwork universe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think at the start of the 20th, uh, 20th century or middle, there's some prominent scientists said that the universe resembles more a mind than a mechanism or a machine. And then the idea was that the mind is far more complex to understand. Mm. So is there anything similar that uh, to your knowledge science has come up with the idea of there might be some yes. science won't acknowledge the presence of conscious agencies, mm. but any force that might actually limit uh, a human cognition or human cognitive ability. Mm. Um, I think there's a recognition that um, our perceptions and observations are limited. And so therefore there's a sort of a veil, um, a, a, a limit to, uh, the, to our knowledge. There's a limit to uh, observation or our perce perceptive knowledge. And I think a place where this really shows up is the idea of multiple dimensions. So in mathematics, even a, you know, a high school student, they solve calculus um, equations, you know, they solve math problems in the sixth or seventh dimension. So in order to solve a problem in the first dimension, you, 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 know, you know, it's X to the sixth, 
You solve it in the sixth dimension, you bring it back. So mathematically speaking, nature and the world can be modeled into many, many dimensions. But we as human beings cannot make sense of more than three dimensions. We can, we can write it down on a piece of paper, but there's no way intellectually we can make sense of what it would be to have a six dimensional world. Mm. So there's a recognition there that science uh, needs to recognize thoughtful scientists that there is realities beyond our perception and our perception, like you mentioned, our, you know, the observer themselves are limited and people who observe science, they may not be scientists themselves. Uh, they recognize this, like for example, Schopenhauer, a very more contemporary Western philosopher. He talks about the veil uh, of, of Maya. Uh, he's he's a very you know he, he's really enthusiastic about this veil because you know he he does believe that there's a certain veil, a certain limit. You could call it the speed of light, but there's certain uh, natural elements that limit our understanding of the world because we are in a veil. There's a sort of okay. curtain, curtain. Yes. Uh, so, there are some physicists who have said that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose or queerer than we can than we imagine it is queerer than what we can imagine now it's attributed yeah. to jps halden and many others so it does seem that uh, so maybe not the concept of maya but the idea that we are limited in our our capacity to know hmm. that is something which is uh, which is being you could say not uh, what to say it's almost like a grudging acknowledgement, which is coming up to some extent. Now, turning to Maya, you know, generally what, when I read your book, what struck me is that usually we talk about Maya as a, as a force that tempts and deludes us. And it's more in terms of, uh, say, the willpower or the discipline or the purity to resist it. So as practitioners, that's the that's the concept of Maya we primarily operate with. But it's not just in terms of, say, actions, but Maya, Maya or not, not actions, you could say, Maya as a philosophical concept mm -hmm. is not something which we explore so much. Mm -hmm. It's more as a Maya as an agency that will delude us and we have to be afraid. Of, we need to be cautious about it, if not afraid. But uh, the idea of Maya as a philosophical concept mm -hmm. that can be analyzed and understood, that was, I think, quite a striking feature I found in your book. So have you yes. also noticed this difference in the, the nature of the discourse when it is happening, say, within the tradition and within, within more philosophical circles? Yes, Prabhu. Actually, um, the, um, in the Mayavad traditions, that's why they are called, they are called Mayavad, they do so much with Maya. Because, you know, it's the cornerstone of their philosophy. The world is Maya and therefore, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 everything is Mithya. In the Mayavad, in the Advaita traditions, there are books and books written on Maya. Because it's the cornerstone of their philosophy, of their discussion. Uh, but however, um, uh, in, in our Vaishnav tradition, there is much discussion about Maya, but uh, it appears or Maya functions in different ways. Uh, as I mentioned in my book, Maya relates to the human condition, the one that you're speaking of, which is the most common way of understanding Maya, how Maya affects us. Maya is also described in relation to the world, the natural world, which is the aspect that John Polkinghorne was interested in. Maya is nature, Maya is the world. And Maya is also spoken of in relation to Krishna's pastimes and in terms of spiritual reality, that is yoga Maya, also in terms of creation, creative power. And so in my own studies, I began to see that, you know, Maya is described sometimes as uh, in one place, Srila Prabhupada says, Maya actually doesn't exist, he says. It's just a figment of the mind. Uh, it's just a misconception. In another place, is Prabhupada says, Maya is Krishna's energy. Uh, in another place, uh, he says how um, Maya affects all living beings. 
So all of these uh, different statements were there. And, um, you know, just seeing, you know, uh, just a cursory look at them makes it appear, oh, you know, these are uh, contradictory or these don't make sense. <clears throat> or what is it? In one place, Prabhupada is saying Maya is Krishna's energy. In another place, he's saying Maya is just uh, a misconception. It's just seeing the world incorrectly. So how to bring these understandings of Maya together? Because all the statements should be true. I mean, I, I started sort of with that uh, approach that all the statements uh, are meaningful and Prabhupada is, is saying something in different places. Same thing uh, in terms of the general um, Vedic uh, body of knowledge, uh, more you could say in terms of Puranas, specifically uh, Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, the Upanishads and things, you find the same word translated and used in so many different ways. And how to make sense of them? Is it just like, you know, random that someone uses Maya like this or like this? And then, of course, you have Shankaracharya's interpretation of Maya, which is a whole different thing. So how does our understanding of Maya, how does the Bhagavata's understanding of Maya particularly, how does that relate with all of these different conceptions of Maya? And how do the different conceptions within the Bhagavatam relate with each other? That's something that uh, was my first question to begin with. How do we make sense of all of this? And you know, then then I start to realize, okay, there's there's a, a whole tradition behind this word, uh, all the way from the Vedas to the Upanishads, uh, you know, Mahabharat and the Ramayana, the Shrimad Bhagavatam. They all are using Maya, and how in general are they using it? What are the different ways in which they're using it? And then how does Shankaracharya interpret it? Is it the same? Is it different? Um, and so in order to do this, I actually uh, went through every single instance of Maya in the Shrimad. It's at the end of the book, there's a table of over 500 places where it's used and seeing how is it that, that word used? What is the context of the word Maya? And then recognizing or realizing that, you know, there's, um, there's uh, uh, you know, uh, Maya is a very clear, there's a very clear concept of Maya. And it has a very clear meaning in these texts and it's used in different ways. Oh, okay. So you're saying that even within the same text, the term might be used with different meanings at different times. Yes. Okay. Depending on That's so true. Mm, in fact, uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So, so to, to then to sort of answer that point, that then well, what is it? Uh, what this book shows is that the way Maya is used all the way from the Vedas to the Puranas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Bhagavatam is fundamentally as a creative power. Most fundamentally, Maya is as real as it gets. Maya is a creative energy. It is a creative power. And from specifically, we see even in the Shvetashvara Upanishad, in the Mahabharata, Ramayana, most fundamentally, this power is the divine power of God. It's a divine power of Krishna. It's the power through which God creates the world. Mm -hmm. Now, that power then affects us or affects things in different ways. So that one creative power becomes, becomes a creative energy that creates the world. It's also the power that we harness or we come in contact with as individual beings and it deludes us or it, um, you know, or it uh, is used for mis magical things that people want to do. They use Maya to, to affect others. Or that creative power is used by Krishna for, as his own internal potency. That same energy, his internal potency, is used by Krishna for his divine pastimes. And therefore, it's very interesting that uh, in the introduction to the 10th canto, Srila Prabhupada actually points this out. He says that Maya is one. We then, you know, oftentimes we think of Maya as Maha Maya, Yoga Maya, but he says fundamentally Maya is one. Maya is the creative power, energy of Krishna. Now it can act in a delusive way. And in that way, it's just a misconception. It can act in a way of creative power. It can create the world or it can act as Yoga Maya for Krishna's Lila. But Maya itself is fundamentally one. Okay. So... So what you're saying here is that uh, the 
the if once we get into the philosophical analysis or philosophical understanding of how uh, maya is explained then we can reconcile the multiple senses in which the word maya is used in the scriptures as well as in the sense in which we might be using it yes yes absolutely then once we understand that that maya does not mean illusion most fundamentally maya can be elusive but maya means creative energy then we can understand the way it's used and et- etymologically this has also been shown by contemporary philosophers so shankaracharya always talks about maya uh, as as from the or you, i would say advaitin philosophers as coming from the root ma which means to measure like ma means to measure and so maya is the attempt of measuring the immeasurable brahman brahman is immeasurable it is unlimited it is you know unknowable and when we try to measure it we quantify it that is maya and that is illusion now mm-hmm. shila prabhupad also talks about maya in terms of ma and measure right he he so that is definitely this that is one of the interpretations or ways to understand maya it's not incorrect it is correct to to see it as to measure something that measures the immeasurable however there's another meaning to maya actually a more fundamental meaning it's an older meaning uh etymologically speaking where maya comes from the root ma which means mother right in every language the word ma means mother so you know there must be some truth to it every language it's interesting this is one of the words that no matter what you speak in spanish or english or or greek or hindi or or telugu ma means mother so the root ma means mother and specifically to create like a mother would create so ma means creative power why because a mother creates a child a mother creates milk she nurtures she creates so so more contemporary philosophers like thomas burrow they've argued no this ma meaning to measure is a root but that's a different root than the root of maya and it is it can also be used like shila prabhupad i mentioned also accepts that as a meaning but the fundamental meaning of maya and prabhupad also specifically uses it as in this way uh means to create the creative power it's the creative power of god ma is the original mother and therefore in Sha- sankhya philosophy maya like in vaishnava philosophy uh because bhagavatam also incorporates sankhya maya is not seen as a negative force as it is seen in advaita it's not seen as a trap or something negative that needs to be avoided that's illusion it's unreal but rather it sees it as mother in sankhya maya is seen as mother where she entangles us but her purpose of entangling us is actually to bring us back it's actually to teach us like a mother teaches her child she punishes the child for some time but then through that makes a more beautiful better child so shrimad bhagavatam is actually taking the sankhya meaning of maya maya as mother and therefore there's sections in the bhagavatam where there's prayers to maya there's one one specific section where there's a prayer to maya where the devotee is praying to maya that oh mother please remove your your deluding energy so that i can come closer to the lord so oh. maya yeah maya is fundamentally maya is a good force it's a positive force. it is the energy of god so this ta- turns the tables around where in advaita philosophy and common perception maya is seen as a negative thing i'm trying to show that no in the shrimad bhagavatam and in our vaishnav tradition while maya is teaching us through hard knocks fundamentally maya is a good force because it comes from the ultimate good it comes from god it is a positive energy true you know i was reading the bhagavatam a few years ago i don't remember the exact verse now but i came across this the word is vaishnavi janamohini that is the description for maya so she is a vaishnavi she is a devotee but she is janamohini that's her service so what you're saying is exactly and mm-hmm. i don't remember yeah durga is called as a mother but maya itself being called as uh, herself being called as a mother is remarkable mm. well uh, in the 10th canto when um when uh, uh, krishna uh, lord vishnu yeah. tells subhadra to go to um to go to uh, devaki uh, um mm. no sorry I, i'm getting confused 
yeah, Krishna you. tells uh, Yoga Maya to actually transfer Balram from the womb of uh, Devaki to uh, uh, Devaki to Rohini that time. Yes, uh, but then the other way around also, where then um, uh, Yashoda's daughter, sorry, yeah, Yashoda's daughter, who is fundamentally Krishna's sister, right? Uh, mm -hmm. She is then taken by Vasudev to Devaki. So at that point, uh, you know, this is difficult for her because she's being separated from Krishna. So Krishna tells her that you go there and if you do this service for me, if you, if you go back to Devaki, then you will be worshipped in Kaliyug by everyone. And therefore now we see so many Durga temples and, and she's being worshipped. And then he says, you will have many names. And one of those names is Maya. Another is Yoga Maya. So Maya is Krishna's sister, right? She's here, Yashoda's daughter. And then, and then she goes to um, Devaki and then Kansa takes her and he tries to throw her on the ground and then she goes up and becomes Durga. So to Kansa, she appears as Durga because he's a demon. But to the devotees, Mother Yashoda and all these things, she's actually Krishna's sister. She's even more than Durga. She's an expansion of Subhadra. Okay. You know, that means we could say there are three different levels. I mean, there could be many. And there is, say, there is one level where is, you could say the psychological level at which Maya affects us. Then there is also an ontological level where what Maya actually is. And I don't know whether the word transcendental would be appropriate, where how Maya relates with Krishna in her pastimes. So there could be multiple levels of understanding of Maya also. Yes. Yes. So there's Maya as the world. That's the, the Maya as the energy that creates this world. Uh, there's Maya as the human condition. Uh, so Maya as it affects us and Maya as the divine condition. So this word I use, divine condition, there's no conditioning, but it's a divine condition, meaning that in the, the devotees of the Lord, like Nara the Muni, they are praying in the Bhagavatam to the Lord that please let me come under the spell of Maya, your yoga Maya, so that I can be part of the divine condition, which is a condition of forgetting the power and greatness of the Lord and participating in his Lila. So Maya also in this way bewilders the soul but bewilders them in a good way. So, so uh, uh, in this world, she's bewildering so that we learn some lessons and we, we um, come back to Krishna. She's bewildering in the sense of punishing us. But in the spiritual world, she's bewildering uh, because the devotee wants to forget Krishna's potency, his power. And voluntarily, the devotee is accepting that, um, that forgetfulness for the service of Krishna, to love Krishna spontaneously. Hmm. So just before we go a little bit more into the, in the specifics about Maya, discussing Maya, hmm. uh, would you like to say, contrast something between, say, the concept of the force of delusion in other religions also, before we go into, say, there is the concept of Satan or Shaitan, which hmm. is there in Christianity and Islam. Hmm. So there it seems that their, their idea is that there was an angel who rebelled against, most powerful angel of God who rebelled against God. And then that's how he became the devil. So it does seem that uh, while Christianity rejects that, what is the Manichaean tradition which says there is good and evil, which are always in evil in combat. Mm -hmm. But still there is a, the idea that the, the devil is opposed to God. Mm -hmm. so, yes. so the idea of Maya as uh, Maya as a devotee of God and the devil as a as you could say, a fallen devotee or a anti, a fallen angel or a, you could say anti-angel, they are categorically, there, there is significant difference, isn't it? Yes. And see, uh, this is um, something that I, are, I, I am very enthusiastic about, is that Maya is not something separate from the Lord, like a Satan, like a, you know, a, an evil figure in other traditions. Why? Because Maya is the energy of God. It is mother and it is meant to fundamentally liberate the soul. It's meant to help the soul. Now, the part that is very interesting is that the idea of Satan in Christian traditions is similar to the concept of Maya, to the conception of Maya in Shankaracharya's thought. In really? some ways, it's, and I explain why. Okay. Because 
Yes, because see, for Shankaracharya, Maya is fundamentally something that is bad. Because Maya, um, and of course, he says it doesn't exist, and and you know, uh, Christian thinkers would say that it that it does exist. But in terms of the effect that it has on us, in terms of you know, they're not so much ontologically speaking, but in terms of of the way they are described and their functions. Um, Maya is not Brahman in Shankaracharya's thought. Right? Maya is Maya. Therefore, he says Maya itself is non-existent. The world itself, therefore, is unreal. We say no. The world is real. Maya is real. It is a fundamental power. It is real. Um, and and it just it acts in an elusive way. It is not unreal. But Shankaracharya is saying no. You know, for all practical purposes, Maya is unreal. It is non-existent. The world is also unreal, and therefore, since Brahman is real, Maya is unreal. And and you know, therefore, our Vaishnava Acharyas actually accuse Shankara of being the dualist. He's actually teaching dualism, <laughs> and and we're teaching monism. But he's saying there's two things: there's Maya and Brahman. Now he says Maya is neither real nor is it unreal. It is anirvachaniya. But whatever it is, it is separate than Brahman. It is something that is in competition, or you could say, oh, okay. a separate identity than Brahman. We are in Maya right now. That is the fundamental human problem. We are not in Brahman. In Christianity, they're saying the same thing: that Satan is fundamentally in competition with God, and therefore it's something bad. And you know, God has, has somehow going to destroy this angel, or has destroyed this angel. But we have come under the forces of, of Satan. This is striking. So in terms of ontology, the conception of, uh, in terms of the nature of reality, the conception of Maya and the conception of Satan may be very different. But in terms of, you could say, what you said, the human condition, in terms of how they affect us and how they relate with God, there is a, there is a remarkable level of similarity in terms of the operational aspect, you could say. Yes. yes. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This is the kind of the, uh, you know, in my book, I talk about Shankaracharya's, uh, you know, conception of Maya. This is a major weakness that, you know, just, you know, very unbiased scholars have found in Shankaracharya's thought uh, in terms, it's specifically in terms of his conception of Maya. See, um, so in the, in the Vedic scriptures, uh, you know, before, like the Rig Veda, um, and, and I'm specifically speaking of the Vedas um, and the Upanishads, Maya is seen as creative power, something real and energy that comes from God. Now, what Shankaracharya does is he says that that same, this, that one word, you know, he changes the meaning of the word and he says, from being real, it's unreal, right? He changes the meaning of the word Maya from being creative power it's now something, you know, that is um, fundamentally, um, you know, unreal. So when he does that, then wherever in the text it says that, um, wherever it says that, you know, Bhagavan creates this world through his maya, or um, he appears in this world through his maya, like in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that I appear in this world through this maya, then immediately he says, ah, see, it's coming through maya, therefore it is maya. And Krishna's form in this world is Maya. So all he had to do was just tweak, or you could say adjust the meaning of the word Maya. He didn't have to change the text. He didn't have to reject the, the, the shlokas. Shlokas were the same, Vedas are the same. You just change the meaning of the word Maya. And now all of a sudden, everything uh, that is produced from Maya becomes illusion and unreality. And my argument is that this meaning of Maya, this conception of Maya as something that is separate from God, something that is unreal, is Shankaracharya's own contribution to the history of Indian philosophy. It's his unique, it's his own contribution. It's his own philosophy for which he should get credit for, he should be recognized for. But we cannot say that that is the philosophy of the Upanishads. Because the simple fact is that Maya is used about 14 times in the Upanishads and it's never used in the context of unreality. You know, generally we think, oh, Maya is really an Upanishadic concept. It's, it's hardly an Upanishadic concept. You find Maya in the Vedas, you find an explosion of the use of the terms in the Puranas, 
But as far as the Upanishads themselves, they, they hardly use Maya 14 times and about three or four times they use it as magic. It's some you know description of the magic of Indra or the Devas that's there in the Upanishads. <laughs> or the Tashwara Upanishad, Maya is used as the energy of Rudra, uh, uh, you know, as the creative power of Rudra in, in the Shvetashra Upanishad. Oh, okay. So where does this idea of Maya's illusion come from? It comes from Shankara himself. Now saying it's his own contribution is a very respectable way of saying that it is not based on scripture. It's a respectful way of saying it. Yes. And that's <laughs> that it's not based upon scripture. Yes. Okay. And a part of the problem is in the word uh, illusion. Because the English word illusion uh, can be very misleading. And this is something also that I re recognize. It's not just the Sanskrit words that cause us confusion, but it's also the English words that we use. So illusion in one context can be translated as unreality. And in, an illusion in another context can be translated as mistaking one thing for another, right? That which is not mistaking the, the rope to be a snake, you know, like that. So when Srila Prabhupada is using the word illusion, he's using it in this sense, confusing things, seeing one thing to be an, a, another. When Shankaracharya is using the word, or, or, you know, Advaitins are using the word illusion, they're using it in the sense of unreality. So uh, Shankaracharya says that, that, you know, Maya neither exists nor does it not exist. And uh, Ishvara, the Lord, is Brahman appearing in the world of Maya. So, um, so essentially, Ishvara is is a, is a, you know Brahman seen through Maya. Now, one of the you could say contradictions or problems in Shankara's own thought is that at times he says that Ishvara is Brahman. He does not say that Ishvara is completely Maya, because he doesn't want to give Ishvara that position. But on the other hand, he says that Ishwar is Brahman seen through Maya. So even Advaitins themselves have seen this as a contradiction. And Western scholars, uh, you could say contemporary scholars, have noted that to some degree, Shankara's conception of Maya is incoherent. Because he says two different things in different places. And uh, philosophically speaking, sort of in terms of internal consistency, uh, you know, what is Ishvara? Is God Maya or is he not? And Shankara is not willing to say that he is Maya and only Brahman is reality. And he's also not willing to say that Ishvar is Brahman. Which means that now he has yet a third category. He has Brahman, he has Ishvar, and he has Maya. Okay. So now in terms of world religions that you are saying, so this now, uh, you know, it... it, uh, it in all of these differences, the difference between the Bhagavad conception and the other world religions is that they are seeing things that are, uh, in some Christian traditions, they are seeing Satan and evil as separate from God. And therefore, there are things that coexist with God or that are in competition with God. But the Bhagavata is actually saying that uh, unity in difference. So, you know, oneness and difference that, you know, there is just one fundamental reality and Maya is the energy of God. A lot of concepts you brought in over here. Eh? In one sense, you could say that uh, when we discuss, uh, when we discuss in our norm, or when we read in our normal study and we contemplate, there's a lot that is, you could say, implicit or inchoate. But when we explicitly explicate it, analyze it, that's when the differences become very striking. Mm -hmm. And one place I read about in the same uh, recent book on philosophy, I read that philosophy is in one sense the art of categorization. Mm -hmm. That categorizing yes. what is what. So to the extent we categorize carefully, to the extent actually we are doing philosophy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So just to retrace your thought or re-articulate it to see if I... Just, I got it clearly. So what you're saying is that whereas the Vedic texts in general talk about Maya as a creative energy, but just by changing that, uh, the, the etymological, the semantic implication of that word, uh, Shankaracharya, what he said was that if it's illusion, then everything 
in this world the everything that appears in this world becomes an illusion mm-hmm. and then even even the concept of ishwar also becomes to some extent an illusion mm. yes so, yes so and- okay so just uh, in some ways okay uh, when you said that the two are similar like the christian concept of satan now satan also there are this this what is that book by cs lewis screw tape letters mm-hmm. which where he's talking about how satan is telling his assistants the how to put people in illusion so it's almost very similar to how we talk about how maya is going to put okay this person subject this person to this illusion subject that person to that illusion mm-hmm. so in terms of this this there's a remarkable amount of similarity so but uh, in terms of say our our struggles in this world against temptation so one difference we could say is that uh, i'm talking about difference between the shankaracharya's conception and uh, and say the christian conception is that even christians do say that you need the grace of jesus grace of christ and some christians differentiate between jesus and christ they say jesus is a manifestation of christ which are you want to go into that but the concept of grace is very much there in in christianity is mm-hmm. that concept of grace there ultimately in advaitavad because in one sense it's it might be in there in a prov- provisional reality but the ultimate reality from what i understand shankaracharya says only by gyana one can be liberated not by not by anything else isn't it yes uh, i mean uh... uh uh the uh, this is this is actually um uh you could say the fundamental weakness of advaita philosophy uh, that there is not i i mean so i actually wanted to to mention this so in the idea of anirvachaniya there's the way that shankaracharya gets around the the fact that there is variety in this world that there are things that there are more than one is he says that they neither exist uh, they neither exist nor do they not exist right he says the fundamental uh, ontological uh, position of maya and this world is that it neither exists nor does it not exist now speaking this is you know uh one can say this but one really cannot make sense of this how can there be something that doesn't exist and doesn't not exist how how we talk about either existing or not existing how can you have both or neither so so he's trying to make a third ontological category but he's doing that by by accepting something or by making a point that we cannot make sense of that is so true. if it seems that to some extent word play is required by any tradition which goes toward nihilism isn't it even the buddhists have this category that they say the shunya is a state beyond existence and non existence yes so it seems remarkably similar to what shankara is saying and then uh, so what you are saying is that this is an un- anirvachaniya so t- so to make sense of something when you propose something that doesn't make sense then it's mm-hmm. almost like uh, not explaining but explaining away mm yes isn't it <laughs> yes so um if 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 the world is anirvachaniya then fine it could be that it's a third ontological category but in terms of uh once practice which is the point that you're mentioning here in terms of once practice this does pose a problem or 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 this this maybe not even poses a problem this is an issue that has to be dealt with uh because if the world does not exist then there's nothing to nothing to get liberated from right um so so uh okay so the first thing that i, I was mentioning well uh given that this this you cannot wrap your mind around this one has to um yeah at a present moment accept one or the other right so if if the world d- uh, does not exist there's nothing to get liberated from hence the whole effort of 
gaining liberation is meaningless. Because if, if it doesn't exist, then what are you trying to get liberation from? Who gets uh, moksha? You know, who or what gets moksha? It's just, you know, the, there's no question of moksha because it really doesn't exist. And if it does exist, then we have to operate with the normal uh, vyabharika, you know, uh, uh, the, the day-to-day functioning. So in Shankaracharya, everything has to be understood through that lens. So the same idea with grace. I mean, Shankaracharya is translating texts like the Vedanta Sutra and others that are talking about grace, left and right, about God, about bhakti. So he has to make sense of these things. So then he says, yes, we need the grace of the guru. We even need the grace of, of Bhagavan. I think in his Gita commentary, he talks about this. We need to worship Bhagavan. We need Bhagavan's grace by his mercy. We can get liberation. So then everything functions as normal. But then once we gain liberation, then all of a sudden, um, you know, none of this exists. None of the grace, all of these things um, are important, nor are they, you know, of any relevance. So grace does play an important role in Shankara's philosophy. He, he even ascribes temple worship, getting the mercy of the deity, but then ultimately, it's, it's, it all has to lead to jnana, to knowledge. And once you get that right thought, that knowledge, then you get um, moksha and you become you know, part of Brahman. Now, in, in, in contrasting that to the Bhagavata's philosophy, when understanding the concept of maya, in relation to the concept of maya, grace plays a very important role. Because the number one metaphor of maya and our conditioning under maya is that of the dream metaphor, that we are in a dream state. And if someone is dreaming and they're in, deep in their dream, the only way to get liberation from that dream is if someone outside of the dream, someone who's not dreaming, comes and shakes them and wakes them up. And that is grace. That eventually we can try as much as we want within the dream world to rise and purify ourselves, but we can actually only break out of it when anugraha, the mercy of the Lord, is there. So this is, uh, you know, uh, grace in the Bhagavatam plays a very important role. Uh, we see in the story of Nara, the Muni, and so many of these great sages. Uh, in Shankaracharya's thought, it plays a role, but only on the Vyabharika level. Hmm. So in one sense, see, you started by carving out, when you got into this exploration of Maya, you could say the one purpose was to address uh, the science spirituality discussion, uh, the science religion discussion from a Hindu perspective. But while doing that, it seems that you're also able to ad- address uh, the diversity within the Hindu conceptions of Maya itself and distinguish the Vaishnav position from other positions. Yes. Hmm. So, when you earlier made this point that uh, the Bhagavatam's conception of Sankhya, Bhagavatam's conception of Maya is, is more similar to the Sankhya conception. So now from what I understood in Sankhya, there are basically two realities. There's Prakriti and Purusha. So what is Sankhya conception of Maya as such? What is their understanding of where Maya comes from? So, How does the Bhagavatam say modify that within its theistic perspective? So and that's the thing that when we're speaking of Sankhya, we need to identify which Sankhya, right, that we are speaking of. Because we have the atheistic Sankhya, or often known as the classical Sankhya, which is not necessarily atheistic. It just doesn't speak, it doesn't specify whether God exists or not um, to that degree. And, And then you have the theistic Sankhya. So the Bhagavata, it is drawing from the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata, even if contemporary scholars say, is older than classical Sankhya. And so the Mahabharata talks about a theistic Sankhya. A Sankhya that is um, uh, the same Sankhya that Kapila Muni talks about in the Bhagavatam. A Sankhya that comes from God, that accepts there is a God, and that this world is the energy of God. So the, the older Sankhya is the theistic Sankhya. This is, this is just, uh, you know, even academically speaking, it's, it's a fact. Because the older texts, like the epics, they, they are, you know, they're dealing with Sankhya. Same thing with the Upanishads. The Upanishads are clearly theistic th- texts. 
and you find the seeds of Sankhya actually in the Upanishads. <clears throat> they talk about the different elements and things like this. So in that Sankhya that you find in the Mahabharat, um, Maya is the creative power. So Prakriti and Maya are related. Prakriti is the manifestation of Maya. So Prakriti, uh, you, you, they, so what is Prakriti? You know, all of a sudden in Sankhya, you have Prakriti and Purusha. So Purusha, okay, Purusha is the individual principle. You know, it's, it's the self. Prakriti is also God. But what is, uh, I mean, sorry, Purusha is also God. Now, but what is Prakriti? Prakriti is nature, but where does it come from? How, how is it related with this Purusha in these theistic texts? Well, Prakriti is Maya, and Maya is the energy of God. So oh, okay. in the Mahabharat, in, in the Upanishads and the Vedas, Maya is the energy, right? It is Shakti. It is primarily seen as, as the power, um, the power of God. And, um, uh, you but know, in the Vedas, you... it's a magical power, but yeah. Okay. So, so in one sense, if I understand right, what you are saying is that the Sankhya, which is often thought of as, uh, as atheistic, is more non-theistic. And the theistic conception of Sankhya may actually be older than the non-theistic conception. Is that what no, you're it is. Yes, it is older. Classical Sankhya, according to modern academics, does come after the epics, like the Mahabharat, and definitely after the Upanishads. So the seeds of Sankhya and also Sankhya as you find it in, in the literature uh, before classical Sankhya is theistic. Oh. And Maya, uh, Prakriti is, is considered to be Maya. Now, um, I will give a kind of a, a disclaimer that, that Maya is also more of a Vedanta concept and at a certain point, you know, Prakriti becomes identified with Maya. So in many of these theistic texts, they may not uh, specifically talk about maybe Maya and Prakriti together, but still Prakriti is seen as the, you know, it, Prakriti comes from God. That's the basic point. Whether exactly they portray it as energy or not, but it is a theistic, it, you know, the world comes from God. Mm -hmm. And just on this point, I want to mention that that's why in the Bhagavatam, many places, the Bhagavatam, a text that explicitly does identify, or you could say, um, uh, match uh, Maya with Prakriti. It e equalizes the two. Um, in that text, many times, Srila Prabhupada, when Maya is mentioned there, he says, he says, Krishna appears by his internal potency, or Maya is the internal potency of God. And we often think that, oh, you know, this is just, you know, the Gaudiya Vaishnav take on Maya. You know, this is Srila Prabhupada taking Maya. And it doesn't say Yoga Maya, it just says Maya. And Prabhupada is, is calling it the internal potency of God because this is the Gaudiya Vaishnav interpretation. Yes, the English words are kind of, you know, you could say internal potency. It's, it's uh, the English phrase is there. But that is Srila Prabhupada's phrase. But the point is that Maya as the power of God is not a Gaudiya Vaishnav idea. That is the way that Mahabharat uses it. That is the way that you find it in the earlier text where it's fundamentally power. So Prabhupada is actually being chased to the way that Maya is actually used. There's no reason to believe that Maya has to be negative. It has to be the illusory power. Even if the word yoga is not there, just the word Maya itself is, just means power. It's not, so Prabhupada is not giving a specific interpretation of it. One can, based of context, interpret it as an elusive power. But Maya itself, as a general word, without a context, just means power. So it is us stretching it, or based upon context, saying that, oh, in this case, it's elusive or bad, acting in a, in a negative way. Uh, but a literal translation would just say the power of God, which is what Prabhupada is doing. In, in many of these, these verses that are, that are relating with Krishna, he's, he's just giving the common translation. And as I was mentioning, the, the person who interprets it as in a specific way, that is Shankaracharya. He takes it and says, okay, no, Maya also refers to unreality. And therefore the, the whole philosophy of Mayavad, uh, he is putting his unique take on it. 
But as far as what the earlier texts are using it, and texts in general, the way it's being used in the body of literature, Maya just means power, creative power. Oh, okay. So if we take this forward, then in, so it's almost like the, the same word uh, can, by giving a different meaning, can be used to, so you could say, justify or ground an entirely different philosophical uh, conception itself. Mm. Mm. Yes. So yes. if we take the, that particular angle further, now what would that mean practically in terms of, so the, the understanding that Maya is the energy of Krishna or Maya is the energy of God, is this specifically a Gaudiya Vaishnava understanding or is this a broad Vaishnava understanding itself? And what, I, uh, what I'm mentioning is that it's not even just a Vaishnava understanding. It is the understanding of the Puranas, the Upanishads, um, the, the, uh, uh, the Mahabharata, Ramayan, even farther. The Maya is always seen as energy in the Shvetashara Upanishad. It's the energy of Rudra. Now, Maya means energy. So depending on the context, we understand whose energy it is. So it, so it might be the energy of Shiva. It might be the energy of Indra. And it might be the energy of Krishna. So the idea that the world is coming from Krishna's energy, that is a Vaishnav conception. That, it, it, that Krishna's energy is creating the world. So, so that Krishna is the source of everything. That is Vaishnav. Shaivas would say Shiva is the source of everything. But Maya's energy, that is... That is for all traditions. Only Shankaracharya said that Maya is not energy. And so and, and Maya is, you know, uh, uh, fundamentally, that is there. Now, who has it? That's a matter of discussion. And this is where the idea then of yoga Maya comes, which is very interesting. That in the Mahabharata, yoga Maya is also used, the word yoga Maya, because Maya is produced from yoga. And the sages, they also have maya. I mean, th this word is so uh, broad. It's not just even used in terms of the world or God. Uh, most commonly, it's just used in terms of the power that individual beings have. So sages also have maya. Where do they get their maya power from? Their magical power, their mystical power from? They get it from their yoga. And therefore, yoga maya simply means maya that's produced from yoga. In terms of the oh. universe... Whose yoga is it produced from? If it's produced from Krishna's yoga, then the Bhagavatam says this is Krishna's yoga maya. If it's produced from Shiva's yoga, then it's uh, you know, a Shaiva text, which is saying this is Shiva's yoga that's producing it. So yoga produces maya. And therefore, sometimes it's called yoga maya. And when it's Krishna's internal potency, then we use it more specifically yoga maya in terms of spiritual things we use it more in context of that because it's krishna's own yoga that's producing it but in the bhagavatam yoga maya is also used to refer to material nature and i give instances of that in my book where yoga maya is used to describe the material creation it doesn't use specifically just the word maya and in uh, and in the context of krishna's leela just the word maya is also used and then you see Prabhupada translates it as Krishna's internal potency. Because yoga is just a describer, it's just a qualifier on the word maya. Yoga is not, uh, it's just describing where is that maya coming from. Okay. That's quite a significant uh, categorization in, in terms of the difference. So, so, is the word yoga, the concept of yoga maya is the divine energy. Is that a Gaudiya Vaishnava conception or even that is something which is a, which can be drawn from the, you said the Upanishadic texts themselves? So yoga maya as related to Krishna's rasa lila and yoga maya as, you know, Krishna's internal potency that allows for all the leelas of the, of the coward boys and Mother Yashoda, that is a Gaudiya Vaishnava conception particularly applying it in that way. But yoga maya, as maya produced from yoga, and the term yoga maya, you find in the Mahabharata, everywhere. The sages, the kings, 
they perform yoga to get maya, then they get yoga maya, and from that they attack the other you know party. And whoever and whoever has more yoga maya, they will conquest. They will win. You know they will be more powerful. So uh, yoga maya, as the power produced from yoga, is all over the place. In the Mahabharat, in the Upan, uh, not in, so much in the Upanishads, but the Mahabharat, uh, the Puranas. Um, uh, 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 in, in other um, literature as well. That's significant. And uh, so overall, when we talk about the concept of Maya in our tradition, and uh, when we seek the, the mercy of the Lord for say for developing a love for him for overcoming the the influence of my the tempting influence of maya so is there a, you, you could say that is there a categorical difference in the way we would so the concept of grace we could say is common between say christianity and uh, and vaishnavism to some extent or bhakti tradition or mm-hmm. but uh, is there because there is the devil is antagonistic and Maya which is not? So, is there any other practical difference that will be there in in our in our practices based on mm-hmm. the different divergent understanding? So, I'm just trying to take this discussion now from a more abstract level to a you could say a more practical level. So, how does the how does getting a more refined understanding of Maya change our practice of sadhana or change our the way we live in the world yes i think i think it does uh, very practically um because when we have a deeper understanding of maya that, then unlike satan and you know uh, these other evil uh, conceptions uh, conceptions of evil we will see maya more as our friend than as something to be overcome or an enemy. So Maya will we will see okay, uh, and this is the, the, you know the crux of the philosophy that rather than seeing Maya as an enemy, but engaging Maya in the Lord's service, engaging Maya in Krishna's service. So we we see it okay. This is the potency of God. This is divine. Daivi hiya guna mai mama Maya duratya. That this is Krishna's own divine power. So because it is Krishna's own divine power, one, it's more powerful than me. There's nothing in the world that I can do. There's no amount of spirituality, meditation, yoga that I can do by which I can overcome this maya. This maya is more powerful than me. I have to surrender to it. It is, it is God's power, right? But I can cross over this if I, um, if I uh, use Maya in the service of the owner of Maya, which is Krishna. So, so there's no way that I can overcome. This is far more powerful than me. So, 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 and therefore the importance of grace, uh, the importance of bhakti, of mercy, that I have, to, uh, um, I have to appeal to the Lord out of love, out of mercy, that please remove it because this energy is more powerful than me. And please allow me to see its proper use in its proper way. Um, I remember, I think one time, Sachinanda Maharaj, he said this, that as long as we try to fight Maya, it will always overcome us and disturb us. But when we are, um, but when we are, uh, are appreciating Maya in the service of the Lord, then we can overcome it. So, so this is the difference of uh, viewpoint, yes, that... The uh, the impersonalist sees it as bad, jagat mithya. This is all false, or or even you know anyone uh, you know a spiritualist tends to see that this world is very very bad. But then the advanced spiritualist sees, oh, there's a great opportunity in this world, and actually this world is very very nice. Uh, he, he enjoys the world on the basis of seeing that all of this is the energy of the Lord. And I'm going to engage it in the Lord's service. And so it's so beautiful. It's so wonderful because it is the energy. It is the power of my dear Lord. And 
um, and I'm going to engage it and utilize it for its proper purpose. purpose. Appreciating Maya, it's quite a, a remarkable concept. I think Prabhupada says in the Queen Kunti prayers that that, that his uh, one of his lectures that that. That Maya is ultimately meant to make you more serious in your bhakti of Krishna. So that's also an appreciation. Now, Prabhupada put something like that. Maya checks whether you want to serve Krishna or you want to disturb Krishna. Uh -huh. So <laughs> it's a nice way of putting it. Yes, it is. Wow. Now, of course, until we can actually see its connection with Krishna, because it is so powerful, we should also be a little um, cautious. Like Prabhupada said, we should be afraid of Maya. So we cannot become too overconfident yeah. uh, uh, because we have to, you know, there's a, there's like, there's sort of a strategy that Krishna has given that this is the way out. So we have to follow that strategy. That is the regulated principles and all these things. But the real vision or the deeper vision of the devotee is that no, uh, like Prabhupada says, you know, uh, that the world is so beautiful Then how beautiful must be its creator. Uh, and, uh, how can I engage this, the beautiful things in this world in God's service? That is the real thing. Not to say, oh, it's ugly. Uh, it is beautiful. It's very nice. But how to engage it in God's service? And it's interesting that actually this concept was very much there in the you know, 17th, 18th century in Western Europe among the Christian uh, uh, um, priests. That this is the birth of modern science. This is how science began. That they said that um, studying nature was studying the mind of God. Natural and because, yeah, natural. And because the world is the mind of God and, and it's the handiwork of God, then studying the handiwork of God was a way of worshiping him. So it was their form of worship to appreciate the glory of God. So recognizing the relationship of Maya with, with God, that is the key thing. Mm -hmm. You know, with respect to this point, that uh, there's simultaneously appreciation and caution both. There is this, uh, the Bhagavad Gita also talks about how everything beautiful in this world represents the, a spark of Krishna's splendor. Yadyad vibhuti mat sattvam, shrima durjita me eva tatta deva gachattvam amatejo amsha sambhava. So to some extent, if, if one is at a level when one can, uh, one can, you could say appreciate without getting captivated or one can mm -hmm. one has developed a sufficient level of either we could say detachment so that one doesn't get uh, ops captivated by it or one has developed a certain level of devotion by which one is captivated by something higher mm -hmm. then there is a appreciate there is the capacity to appreciate maya also so i would like to i mean we, i would like if we can take this con discussion of concluding parts in two different directions. Maybe we could be able to uh, put in both. So uh, you mentioned earlier that you talk about three levels of Maya. One is there's a human condition and there's a divine conditioning and a human conditioning, divine condition, and, then, and the world itself. Mm -hmm. Was that the three things you mentioned? Yes, the world, so, the human condition, divine condition, yes. Yeah, uh, so then how do we relate this with the Bhagavatam Chatushloki definition that Rite Artham Yat Pratyeta Na Pratye Chatmani Tam Vidya Datmano Maya Thavasu Yatatama that to see uh, see anything as significant separate from its connection with the ultimate reality. That is Maya. So is that Maya being defined in terms of the human conditioning? Or where would you put that understanding? Yes. Yes. Um uh, so uh, just one thought, uh, and then we'll come to this point, that uh, in the Bhagavatam repeatedly it says Maya as Atma Maya, Krishna Maya, that this Maya is uh, subordinate and coming is coming from Krishna and is subordinate to Krishna, right? So, so it this Maya depends on Krishna. It's dependent on Krishna. And this is a very fundamental difference between the concept of evil in, in, uh, in a tradition that sees it in competition with God as opposed to depending upon God. There's a verse in the Bhagavatam that as soon as 
Maya sees Krishna, she feels as if ashamed, even though she's coming from Krishna, but because she has the impalatable work, unpalatable work uh, to, to, you know, uh, to delude us um, and take us through this, um, this material world, she feels ashamed. So she's clearly in a subordinate position to Krishna, not in one of competition or, or like that. Um, and, um, uh, and so one has to recognize the subordinate role of Maya to Krishna, and therefore the devotee is engaging Maya in Krishna's service without getting attracted to Maya, uh, but being attracted to Krishna. So it, it's still subordinate to Krishna. So our main object of attachment is Krishna, but we are engaging Maya in Krishna's service. Now, as far as uh, the, the Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam, how it uses this verse, it's, uh, it's um, uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, nice, this beautiful verse, Riti Artham Yat Pratiyeta Pratiyeta Chatmani, Yat Atmano Mayam. So Krishna here is making the same point that this is my Maya. It's coming from my own Atma. This, this, is, uh, this Maya is actually originating from the Lord. Hmm. But uh, th this is my Maya. So in, in the Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam, it is saying that this whole world is coming from me. This is, this is um, nothing but me, right? Th that's the first verse. And so therefore... If you see something as separate from me, you see this world as separate from me, then that is called Maya. You are, you are seeing it, but you are seeing it as separate from me, and that is your Maya. So because it is part of me, it is actually nothing but me. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all just you know, um, a part of this world. So the first verse says that Krishna is everything. The second verse then puts qualifications to it. So it says, no, there's things that are separate. Or, or, or there's things not that are separate, but that um, there's um, uh, oneness and difference. It, it, it emphasizes the different side. But then the third verse, this verse is then saying, no, but then if you see them as completely separate from the Lord, if you see them as separate from the Lord, then you are in my Maya. Then you are engaged, you, are, you have fallen into Maya. So although we have oneness and difference, and we see the difference, we see the oneness, but still, we cannot forget that although th things are different from the Lord, we are different from God. But Maya means if we don't see their connection with God, they're still connected with God. So therefore, Prabhupada, you know, he, he translates this verse and he says that, that you know, uh, uh, he gives the explanation of the shadow and the reality that Maya is trying to just live or see the shadow world without recognizing the relationship of the shadow with reality. With, with the object that it is the shadow of. So in the purport, Prabhupada makes a big point of this, that this is what Maya is basically. It's, it's forgetting that relationship, which is the human condition. So the world is always the world. The Maya as a creative power is always going to be the world. Uh, that is clearly the world. Uh, Maya is yoga Maya, Krishna's spiritual energy, his internal potent, his energy which manifests the internal uh, spiritual world. That is also as it is. The only part that needs work is Maya in relation to the human condition, that our vision needs to change and we have to see the world in relationship with Krishna. So mm -hmm. this verse is speaking of it in terms of the human condition. Yes. So that's a... Uh, it's, it's striking that here Achinte Vahidavid also comes in then, where in the conception of uh, Maya, you could say, the conception of Maya itself and the nature of uh, how we pursue Maya also. Yes. So now taking this forward, maybe this could be the concluding point. We can discuss that. See, there is to some extent, uh, when we start our spiritual practices, we often get a black and white understanding. Mm. This is Maya and this is Krishna. Mm. And then as we move forward, we start getting a more nuanced understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, there's not, everything is not just black and white. That there are shades of grey. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we may learn the devotees and everybody is the not, not a devotee. We may use uh, every, it's almost, almost every tradition seems to have some 
pejorative way to refer to those who are not its followers mm-hmm. now we may use the word karmis christians may use the word pagans the muslims mm-hmm. may use the word kafirs mm-hmm. so that insider outsider differentiation is there <clears throat> but that can also lead to a lot of polarization and uh, and conf- and conflicts also so now as as devotees uh, as we grow in our spiritual life then we start realizing that that the borders between you could say maya and non maya don't neatly coincide with the borders between say affiliation with the tradition and non affiliation with the tradition mm-hmm. or even even more uh, uh, even more damagingly affiliation with the institution and non affiliation with the institution mm. so this uh, black and white understanding of of what is maya what is not maya so in one sense uh, we can say that even a person who is a mundane singer maybe like prabhupad saw in allen ginsberg there was so much which was there was so much which was objectionable you know he was he was a he was uh, he was a gay person he was advocating drugs mm. and as a means to spirituality which is quite opposed to what prabhupad was saying and he was he was a pioneer of the whole counter culture mm. and at the same time prabhupad saw the good within him so this mm. uh, so he saw that in fact i read one conversation where prabhupad says you know you are blessed by krishna there was this mm. ohio state university program where but it is a big one of the biggest college program which prabhupad had Uh, which was organized by devotees and prabhupad wanted alan alan to start the sing do the kirtan in the beginning and then he said you also give the talk he said no no swami this is your tradition you give the talk and then prabhupad said you know you give the talk he says no this is your tradition so prabhupad said you you lead the singing he says you are blessed by krishna so that is uh, that is a nuanced understanding where prabhupad could see yes there are many things which 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 may which which are you could say the results of the influence of maya but still there are results of the influence of krishna also within him so this black and white conception of spirituality of bhakti how ma- uh, sometimes it can be very damaging because we can label and uh, label and alienate anybody who is not a devotee so do you feel that this nuance understanding of maya can also help us avoid such black and white understandings and i think prabhu you put it really well actually this is this is the very uh, purpose of in some ways uh, the practical purpose of this study that um that uh, a, a very uh, you know just black and white picture misses the nuanced understanding of the nature of the world uh, the nature of of the creation because you know that's the thing the black and white understanding is that maya is something negative is something bad is something to be overcome and avoided but a more nuanced understanding which shri prabhupad is presenting is that no it's also the energy of the lord and ultimately maya is being compassionate maya's role is one of compassion it's the man prabhupad says this actually in one place that maya is the manifestation of krishna's compassion so there isn't really something like maya and krishna or or there's uh, or something like uh, black and white uh, even those in so called maya are still in in the arms of krishna they're still they're still under the 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 veil of krishna's own power and this um and this world is not fundamentally bad it's just uh uh the the it, it needs to be used in krishna's service so um so this is you know th- this is uh, in fact the illusion this is in fact the problem that we are seeing things as separate from the lord that is the problem so if we continue seeing them as separate from god if we see one person as separate from god this person is bad like you're saying uh, every tradition sees uh, the non believers in uh, in negative terms then we are all, we are still in maya because we're still seeing things as se- as separate from the lord and it's interesting in the bhagavatam there's the pastime of jay and vijay and um if you if we go to actually that pastime that that story that narration then their offense was the, the reason why they were falling from the spiritual world is because they were seeing separate from the lord it particularly mentions this they're seeing separate from the lord 
uh, they were seeing difference that, oh, these children, the, these devotees, they're just children. They're just, they're not sages. They're just children. So we should not allow them. Uh, they were making oh, distinction. Okay. One is, you know, they were seeing as separate uh, that, oh, this is just boys. And because they're boys, they cannot be devotees or they're not sages, right? Uh, but the Lord did not have that vision. He was seeing them in absolute terms that, okay, no, that vision is of what is pleasing to the Lord, what is not. That's only, you know, no, no duality there. Only one vision, what is pleasing to the Lord. So because they were seeing separate from the Lord, therefore they, they, were, they were falling. So we have to see everything in relation to Krishna. That is what um, Bhagavatam is telling us. Now, we don't accept everything uh, because we're not meant to accept everything, but we still have to see everything in relation to Krishna. Like you're saying, so um, yeah, that uh, that uh, Maya and and um, I, I should mention that um, many people have observed this. Uh, uh, the German philosopher uh, Paul Dusen, he said that Maya is the most important concept, or you say the most central concept in all of Eastern thought. And then uh, Sanskritist, more recent Sanskritist Daniel Ingalls, he said that Maya is one of the most beautiful concepts in the history of, uh, in the intellectual history of religious thought, he said. Really? One of the, yes. I know Ingalls, he said, one of the most beautiful concepts. And it's per precisely because of this, because it allows us a way to connect the world with God, to subsume uh, the evil elements, the bad elements with God. And at the same time, God remains transcendental because of this conception of energy or maya. And, and, uh, and so it gives us a way, it's one of the most beautiful concepts, it gives us a way to relate God and his energy. Of course, then that raises new problems that, okay, well, if, if this world is the energy of God, then why is there evil and suffering in this world? Uh, why is it you know, so difficult the way it is? But that we talked about in our previous discussion, mm. uh, the previous evil that well no this is why maya's compassion maya's teaching us uh it's it's training us uh now in very difficult ways sometimes but still it's training us and it's connected with god so it, it is a uh, very much a very beautiful conception uh the energy the idea of energy or shakti maya shakti because it allows for oneness and difference unity and diversity yes this is we always talk about how the Krishna conception of God is beautiful, but the idea of the conception of Maya is also beautiful. I remember reading this long ago, but it it didn't register in me at that time. So when you're saying it's beautiful in the sense that, are you saying that it's beautiful in the sense that it helps us reconcile the distressful nature of the world with with a merciful God, or what is the what is the beauty in this? Mm. Uh, the beauty is the compassion, right? It's, it's, it's a beautiful concept because now all of a sudden the world being evil and horrible and uh, it's now a compassion mother that Maya as mother that is uh, creating this world as a playground for us so we can come back to him. So the beauty is in the Lord's compassion and his love that actually the world is not a place of punishment it's, the world is not created by God to, you know, take and, you know, enjoy seeing us suffer, take us and make us suffer. But rather the world is created by God out of his compassion as a way to bring us back to him. Oh, okay. Therefore, it's a very beautiful concept that uh, uh, for, for this reason and also for the other reason which you are mentioning that it uh, allows us to philosophically re reconcile the relationship between the world and God. You know, it's allowed the tradition to do that, that, you know, okay, achintya bheda bheda, how is the world coming from God, yet it is also separate from God. And so, you know, in, in Vyasa's vision at the beginning of the Bhagavatam, it's, he sees the whole creation. He sees everything and he sees three things. He sees the Lord, he sees the living beings, and he sees Maya, the Lord's energy. And he sees that the living beings are struggling very hard in this material creation. So Maya is the way that Krishna um, relates with the living beings and, and 
it's his world of compassion. So that is what the um, the whole vision or conception and motivation of the world changes. Oh, okay. That's that's striking, and then that brings us again to the. To you could say we didn't get so much time to discuss the concept of yoga maya and the idea of how Krishna performs leela, which which is which of course is a very beautiful understanding, but mm-hmm. here. we can say that uh, when krishna when we concept when we say connect maya with the idea of compassion then it also it also going back to the earlier black and white conception see often the black and white conception the metaphor that is used is often of a war that mm-hmm. we are fighting a war against the illusory energy yes. and propal also uses that conception i think with respect to caution that metaphor is helpful but yes. we could if we consider maya as compassionate then we could maybe use the word a metaphor of education or something mm-hmm. like that where yes there are tests and a student has to pass the test and the student there are cons- there are grave consequences if student doesn't pass but the student doesn't have a adversarial relationship with with the educational system mm-hmm. it's not that there is somebody out to deliberately fail the student mm-hmm. so in yeah. that sense also the level of hostility or level of negativity can be decreased if we have this more uh, compassionate understanding of the purpose of maya yeah no um uh, and that was eye opening for me you see like because on one hand we have the image of krishna playing the flute with the coward boys and you know this beautiful spiritual dimension like you're saying conception of krishna so beautiful so we have this wonderful krishna who's who's there loving all the cows and 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 the the cow uh, you know the residents of vrindavan and then we have this material world which is so horrible and everything is so bad so how do we take this beautiful krishna and this world and and we re- reconcile the two people say oh, this is a joke you know i mean it's like okay god is so wonderful loving but why not seeing it in application and honestly this used to bother me a lot personally also like why why is this like this you know what is you know i mean if krishna is so kind why couldn't he find you know <laughs> a better way to do this but then after studying you know after examining the conception of maya we understand that well um it, like you're saying it is it is very um difficult but uh but maya's mother Uh, you know krishna is coming as the mother and and helping us training us uh you know anything that happens is not bad therefore everything has a good purpose because it helps us progress it's always progress in this world it's always progress is a mother is trying to help the child progress mm. so uh, the conception of a god as father and judge has changed from to a conception of mother and nurturing that the mother nurtures maya is nurturing the soul Uh, helping the soul reach the place where it wants to reach but is unable to do so so it's it's nurturing the soul through these experiences to come to the place where we want to be that's that's striking so when you talk about maya as or the world as a nurturing place you know long ago when the tsunami had happened i had a, i had written some articles responding that in indian newspapers like trying to make sense of the whole tragedy so i had somebody had forwarded me a book and they had that book contained the responses of various world traditions world religious traditions how do you make sense of it mm-hmm. and i was quite disappointed at that time to see that the hindu response it had been written by by an by a advaitic scholar mm-hmm. so it says that you know suffering doesn't matter because ultimately this world is like a dream so everything here is illusion so suffering also is illusion and it seemed to be a very dehumanizing way of looking at looking at uh, the gravity and the immensity of the suff- catastrophe that had visited humanity at that time so the idea sometimes the idea is that if we treat maya simply as illusion then the sufferings that we go through they seem they do really seem pointless but if we see maya as uh, as uh, the energy of the lord then even if we can't make sense of the sufferings but still we understand that they are having a purpose that they will help us grow 
sometimes when we are studying also we may not particularly understand you know why we have to do a particular assignment or why we have to study a subject which we don't like or why we are subjected to particular kinds of disciplines but we understand that overall we are in a framework which is going to help us grow so that idea of maya that that maya is conveying the meaninglessness uh, conveying the meaninglessness of events in the world is that a broadly an advaitic idea um so uh, as i mentioned the dream metaphor is used over 60 times in the bhagavatam it's the most common metaphor that is used uh uh in the bhagavatam to describe the human condition and it's also a metaphor that shankaracharya uses but see it's uh uh to answer your question specifically that you were saying it's it's um it's an idea that's both in shankaracharya in advaitic idea and also vaishnava idea but the difference is what we do with it so in the so one thing that across the board all the um uh all the schools of vedanta agree is that the world is temporary and because it is temporary the things of this world lose its value i mean i mean it becomes less valuable if something's temporary it's less valuable well in the advaitic idea or you could say just as a general thing um yes that minimizes the importance of the world it minimizes the importance of so many things but vaishnava idea also uses the dream analogy and important to realize that both shankaracharya and the vaishnav school are both taking the dream metaphor from the upanishads so the dream metaphor is not coming from shankaracharya the metaphor of uh, the snake and the rope is not coming from shankaracharya they're coming from previous texts and they both take those metaphors but they do different things with it so in the vaishnav uh, conception it is a dream and it's all temporary but then the fact that it is temporary does not reduce its value it in fact becomes very very important because it is the activities in the dream world that take us out of the dream world and allow us to engage in the permanent world so now those same activities with a different world view are now having are becoming so much more meaningful because yes all traditions agree that they're temporary but on one hand you know just general vedanta you know other vedanta schools they said well it's temporary therefore it's it's meaningless it's not important uh, it's temporary forget about it but now bhagavatam is saying no it's very very important it's temporary but it is very very important because even though it's temporary it is specifically your actions in the dream that will allow you to break out of the dream that will inspire the grace of grace of god and allow you to break out of the dream so those same very same temporary activities become of ultimate of become of eternal importance mm-hmm. they become of eternal importance because they lead us to eternality and that's why uh like you're saying i loved your point that the bhagavatam brings more significance and meaning to our suffering in this world it brings more significance and meaning to our activities in this world uh because that suffering will lead us to the permanent it is meaningful it's not just illusion like you were saying that uh, that oh it's it's all uh, suffering doesn't exist well how does that help i am suffering <laughs> i am suffering and and this is so painful uh, how does that help me to know that actually it doesn't exist or how is that being compassionate or conscientious if we say that certainly it, it exists but it's meaningful because it it is only meaningful because it takes us to the permanent mm-hmm. <clears throat> so overall the again this point comes that it's not just a matter of uh what the principle is or what the metaphor is it's also how the metaphor is explained or how the metaphor is applied mm-hmm. so the dream metaphor i what you said is something which i have also emphasized that sometimes the dream metaphor is a, you wake up from the dream and you get out of you get out of the illusion and you realize it's mm-hmm. just a dream so balle vidya bhushan i think in his govind bhasha he says that in his commentary he says that in one sense he actually inverts this dream metaphor i found that one of the most brilliant explanations he says that 
is this this world is like a dream but then he argues that like the dream in the dream also sometimes we experience reality sometimes the guru appears sometimes krishna appears so when he says that that when we say the world is like a dream instead of calling the world as unreal he uses the same metaphor to say that even the dream can be real yes and the difference is that so if the world if the our wake, waking reality and dream reality also both real then what is the difference so he says in the waking reality there is the possibility to practice sadhana by which you can wake up by which you can actually wake up so the waking reality it's not just simply like a dream by one activity one will wake up and then realize in the waking state we have to consciously act according to dharma according to and pursue pursue nishreyas pursue pursue the enlightenment so that's why it even the so the dream reality is not meant to trivialize our experience we can say but it is meant to uh, you could say encourage us to pursue a higher experience through our experience and through our actions in this world through our experiences in this world yes yes and i would go as far as saying because the world is real therefore it is like a dream because a dream is real therefore we experience it therefore we cry therefore we scream and shout in the dream because there is a real experience to it and in one place just adding to what you're saying what you said was a complete thought i i, I you know but uh, in one place prabhupad actually says this i again i i wish i had saved the quote but he says this uh he says that um uh you know th- this world is a dream this world is a dream compared to the spiritual world right because it's temporary it has a beginning and an end this world is like a dream and within this world we are dreaming so that's a dream within a dream and so prabhupada says that when we serve krishna we start serving him so much that we are serving him in the dream within the dream then we break out of the dream of material life so prabhupada says that okay. yes, the advanced devotee is so much absorbed in krishna's service in this world that even when he's dreaming at night he's serving krishna and when we come to that point of intensity that even in our dreams we're serving krishna then we break out of the dream of material life of this dream so when serving krishna within the dream of the dream so in this presently at this time like you were saying in our dream we're serving krishna and the fact that we're serving krishna in a dream doesn't make it any less significant than if we're serving him in the waking state it's just where we are serving him the dream world is a location you know like when we're dreaming at night we go to different places those locations exist in our mind and so we're going to different locations in our mind so when we are serving krishna in all locations that is this material world which is a dream and also within the locations of our mind that is the night dream all the places we are serving krishna then we break out of this dream and in fact this is one of the problems philosophical problems uh, in in western philosophy and also eastern philosophy and that is the problem of the dream within a dream and roger colles and plato himself socrates many of them dealt with this they said that you know if this world is like a dream which they believed it was this world is a dream uh then once we wake up how do we know we're still not in a dream because you know if if i'm this world is a dream bhagavatam says that we know beginning and end so it's all a dream just like the night dream um why do we think the dream is a dream you know why do we consider the night time experience to be a dream we consider it that because it's temporary that's the reason that's the only reason why we know that it doesn't stay it goes away it has a beginning and an end therefore we say it's a dream well this life also has an end as sure as death we say right it has an end so therefore this world also has to be a dream so even philosophers who are not devotees they figured it out that you know this world is also a dream it's just a 100 year dream but then plato said well once we wake up then that state how do we know again i'm not dreaming i might be dreaming again and then i wake up again i might be dreaming again so how will i ever know if we come to the point of actual reality well the only way that we know that will actually come to the point of actual reality is when we come to a world that is eternal that never ends then we can be sure that i'm not dreaming and the reason is is because even if we are dreaming 
if the world is eternal, that is the world that we know. And so therefore it's not a dream. If the world is eternal, it's not a dream because the very definition of a dream is, is a temporary state, right? It has an end, therefore we call it a dream. But an endless world, a world that is eternal, it cannot be a dream because it's eternal. That is the world that we're going to be in. So what you're saying is that the, the only, met, only way to come out of this uh, infinite regress is by positing a eternal world. Yes. And uh, just, to, just to maybe take this point a little further then, uh, how do we decide where the infinite regress ends? So we have a we have a dream world, then we have a waking world. So we could say that because both these worlds or both these experiences are temporary. Mm -hmm. So anything that is temporary could be or would would be a step forward in the regress. Would would be prone to regression. But if something is eternal, then it won't be prone to regression. So in that sense, these two are temporary, but the spiritual level of reality is eternal. So that's where the regression ends. Yes, that's how. That's, that's where it ends. And to my knowledge, that's the only way we can know it ends. Yeah, that is true. That's the only way we can know because any world that we're in, we don't know that am I dreaming right now or am I awake? Except if we see that this world is, um, uh, you know, eternal. And, and of course, you know, when we are with Krishna, then all knowledge comes to us. But we're just uh, philosophically speaking, you know, this is this is the fundamental difference. This is why the spiritual world is the real world, because it is eternal. And any world in this, any place in this world, be it Brahma's abode, is not spiritual. It's, it is still a dream because it's temporary. Beautiful. So, a Brahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravartina Arjuna. So in one sense, Krishna is telling about also in the sense that these are places of distress because they are temporary. They are, they are rather, you could put it, they are, they, are, they are temporary and that's how they are places of distress. Yes, so whereas but, but the other, my abode is the place where you will, uh, where, where it's eternal and, it's, and it's free from distress. Okay. Yes, bro, beautiful. There's so, one that... Nice story, beautiful story of the monk, uh, <clears throat> Jung Su. He is a Taoist Buddhist monk. And <clears throat> at night, he dreams that he's a butterfly. <clears throat> so one morning, he wakes up <clears throat> and he begins running around the whole monastery asking the other monks, <clears throat> am I a butterfly dreaming that I'm a monk? Or am I a monk dreaming that I'm a butterfly? He says, because at night I was a butterfly and I was dreaming that I'm a monk. <clears throat> and now I'm a monk and I'm, uh, sorry, at night I was a monk dreaming that I'm a butterfly. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, now uh, I'm trying to figure out, am I, a, you know, a butterfly dreaming that I'm a monk? Or am I a monk dreaming that I'm a butterfly? Okay. And finally, yes, <clears throat> finally the point is that actually both are dreaming states. The monk is right. During the day, he's a monk dreaming. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, he, during the day, he's he's a monk dreaming, or he he may be a butterfly dreaming that he's a monk. <clears throat> and at night, he's a he's a monk dreaming that he's a butterfly. Both are temporary. They're both dream worlds. The only real world is the spiritual world. Yes. Amazing. Hmm. So, should I try to summarize? You'd like to add some concluding points? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's been wonderful. So, we started discussing today about the concept of, you could say broadly, what Maya is and what it isn't. Uh, so, that was a broad topic. So, when you started your study of science and religion, so from the Hindu perspective, something is to be explained, then the concept of Maya became central. And that's how you decided to, uh, that was one impetus for you to explore the subject and write the book. And the idea, even within modern science, the idea that the what science observes is not necessarily the same as the nature of reality. That has become evident not just through quantum physics, but even through the conception, say, of 
space and time being within the universe within relativity so all that science can study is space and time not the universe itself so so what do we mean by when you don't study the universe or even dark matter and things like that so technologically science is progressing but in terms of core science it could be that science has advanced so much that it has hit, it has encountered its own limits and if we consider science and religion are asking the same questions about the nature of reality then science is now exploring those questions whereas religious traditions have been exposing ex, has been investigating those questions for thousands of years so it could we can reasonably infer that these traditions may have valuable insights that we can turn towards and then so we talk about when we come to the concept of maya that there is there is a distance between the world as we experience it and the reality so you talk about was it kant emmanuel kant to talk about nomena and phenomena yes. so that idea is there prabhupada also uses those words i think in 7.3 in a 7.2 and uh, 7.2 actually so there we discussed about so within the concept of maya the some of the advaitic understanding is quite widespread and uh, so we contrasted with, uh, so you brought out some significant parallels between the advaitic understanding of maya and the judeo christian understanding so the idea that satan is opposed to god and similarly maya within the advaitic tradition is something separate from brahman something which stops us from going towards brahman and has its own although they say everything is one but essentially you end up with maya as something separate so in one sense those who are monists are actually dualists because although they say that maya is not real but it is it essentially becomes anirochaniya becomes not just a epistemological uh, status category but also becomes like a ontological category so so you put it nicely that this is this is shankaracharya's contribution not a scriptural not a scriptural teaching other not a vedic teaching and uh, so the so so then the result of this is that there could be a devaluation of the world which we came to later but the concept of mercy which is then the christian tradition which is also there in the vaishnava tradition uh, the and that is that maybe there in the advaitic tradition but it is only in the vyavaharic level the but it don't no ultimately mercy it is you have to rely on gyana and then we explore that uh, so you said that the bhagavatam's conception of maya so there are how many you said 300 references to maya in the bhagavatam or how uh, many over 500 over 500 500, 500 that's significant so the word maya may be used in different senses at different places but if we understand the broad philosophical conception then we can contextualize the various usages so maya maya the bhagavatam and conception of maya is more drawn from the sankhya text where maya is seen as prakriti so purusha and prakriti are two distinct uh, distinct categories of existence and similarly there is there is the there is the bhagwan or the ishvara and then there is there is maya which is um, which may not be specified as the energy of purusha in the uh, sankhya text but you could say that the classical sankhya uh, is maybe is not so much atheistic as non theistic and what the mahabharat talks about is a uh, older sankhya which is theistic so and the bhagavatam you could say develops that conception of sankhya and places it within the context of bhakti also and then the uh, advaitic conception so maya is talked about as a creative energy you saying in even in the vedas or the upanishads in the upanishads but what shankaracharya does is that he takes that to mean illusion and then everything that comes in the world even the the world as well as the lord it is all that becomes illusion mm-hmm. so which is which is not the necessary the scriptural understanding so then we discussed about when we talk about maya there are three levels there is the human the psychological level where human conditioning how it affects it then there is the ontological you could say the world itself is the domain of maya mm. and then there is the ultimately the supreme there is the maya is the divine condition that is the how she acts in the spiritual world so yoga maya is like 
So the concept of Maya is energy is not a, just a Gaudiya Vaishnava conception, but it's a uh, not even a Vaishnava conception. You could say that, but it's a broad Upanishadic conception. And then uh, when we talked about Maya further, the idea that uh, if we see Maya as simply as illusion, broadly there could be several negative effects. One is we conceive existence as adversarial. That rather we see it's like more like a war than education. And then that may create unnecessary negativity that can also lead to devaluation of the world where, uh, where we see the world simply, events in the world simply as chaotic and meaningless. But if you see it as educational, then we see there is something to learn from everything that happens. The world is purposefully arranged for our growth. And then it can also lead to denigration of demonize or demonization of those who are in Maya. So that one zero understanding of, uh, of black and white or insider outsider kind of understanding that is uh, that reflects more Advaitic understanding of the nature of the world than the Vaishnava understanding, which is that yes, we do need caution so that we don't get entangled by Maya, but we also need appreciation that Maya is the energy of Krishna and when we see attractive things in the world, they can point us toward Krishna. And then toward the conclusion, we discussed about how uh, this understanding of Maya, it actually, uh, when we see this as an expression of Krishna's compassion, of compassion ultimately, then it can help us uh, move forward in our bhakti in a more, in a way that Maya is like a mother nourishing us, although testing us and nourishing us, but that can help us move forward so the dreams are not unreal in the sense that they don't that the world is like a dream, not in the sense that the world is false, but that the they are similar in the sense that both are temporary. And the uh, way to avoid infinite regress is we move from the temporary toward the eternal. Uh, any, any points you want to add, Prabhu? No, I think that was a really nice point, uh, nice summary, Prabhu. And um, I personally really enjoyed this conversation. Your own insights actually helped me understand this topic better and, uh, and, and understand the relationship between different points. Uh, so it was a very, um, a very enlightening experience speaking with you and discussing this with you. I'm happy to be of service for it's wonderful to have this discussion and we'll provide a link for your book also since now that it's available in India. Now oh, viewers can get a, get a copy of the book also and they can dive deeper into the discussion. Thank you very much for joining today and look forward Thank to you. having you again sometime in the future. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.